Good afternoon. Welcome to Infra 100, organizing your resources for cost management on GCP. Hope you're having a wonderful Cloud Next. Hope you've eaten lunch. If not, I apologize in advance for standing between you and food. Uh, we'll go through about 40 minutes of discussion, a few minutes for questions, and thrilled you're here. Hope you're having a great conference so far. A reminder, we are seeking your feedback. About 20 minutes into the session, we'll open up feedback and our survey on your mobile app. Please tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, and what you'd like to see in the future. We are here today to answer one question, and that is, what is the best way to structure your resources in order to understand and manage costs on GCP? And so bear that question in mind as we go through a journey today. We'll start with a brief introduction, a couple of definitions and key concepts. It wouldn't be a technical discussion without having hello world. We'll move on to how to structure organizations in GCP, talk about folders and labels, a couple of advanced topics, summarize the whole thing, and then leave time for your questions. First, who am I? I'm James. I'm a product manager in cloud billing. I've been on that team for about two years. And we're a team of product managers and engineers and UI and UX researchers and writers uh, who work every day to help make cloud billing trustworthy, transparent, simple, and predictable. We know you want demand predictability in cloud. And of course, we try to do that at really compelling prices. And today, we'll talk about the structure of resources in cloud, projects being the core, and organizations and folders and labels helping dive down into those projects, separate them out when you need to, and report across them. Labels are a particularly important one for us. And we'll dive into how you can use labels as a cross-cutting way of looking across everything you run in your, in your estate on cloud. And we'll talk about all the different ways you can both report on, visualize, and export cost data. We'll also reference some other sessions later uh, today that talk about budgets, alerts, and controls. We'll touch on those, but there's some other sessions that dive deep into them. And our journey today starts with you as a solo developer. Imagine you're in your garage with your dog, as I'm told all solo developers have, right, of course. And you started on cloud, and you're growing into a small company, into a medium-sized medium company, hopefully into a huge corporation or organization. What does that journey look like on each step of the way? And how do you perceive cost on each step of that journey? So first off. How many of you have eaten lunch? Ah, that's good. That's important. Glad to hear it. How many of you are a solo developer with or without the dog? Any solo developers? N one. A solo, solo developer. That's good. Thank you. How many of you would say you're in a startup? Handful. Right side of the room has solos and startups. Any venture capitalists? Please head over there later. How many of you would say you're in a small or medium-sized organization. Good representation. How about a large organization? Large organizations win. All right. We have answers for you. So along the way, you'll see slides like this, big blue title, a little bit of text under it. These are our best practices. And there are some things we think you really, really should do. We'll summarize them at the end. And of course, these slides will be available online. No need to take notes. First some definitions. We'll talk about organizations, folders, uh, projects, labels, and billing accounts. No need to read the text there. We'll get into each one. So first off, what is an organization? Uh, you can think of an organization as the parent of all of your resources for the purposes of managing roles, permissions, and membership, right? the identity of the people who use your resources in cloud. 
And it's easy to move projects and billing accounts in and out of orgs. If you've started in GCP early on without an organization, it's straightforward to create one later and pull your projects in there to apply central identity and a central permission model. Folders are the next level down of organization, a way to nest some structure underneath that organization. You need an organization in order to turn on folders. And you can have them four levels deep and, and start to create a little bit of isolation. We'll talk about when you might like to use them versus labels in a moment. And of course, folders contain projects. And projects are the heart of GCP. Just about every resource you'll ever run will run in the context of a project. Compute Engine, Kubernetes, Cloud SQL, Storage. I'm sure you're all familiar with these. You've all seen them running in the context of a project. They're also a container for settings and for labeling. And we'll talk about labels later on. But you can both label projects and label resources within projects. And they have slightly different behaviors. Some of our customers, some of our largest customers, operate in a handful of projects, even one. You can put really tremendous numbers of resources in a single project. We have other customers who have tens of thousands of projects. It's up to you. It should mirror how you work. And we'll talk about some of those trade-offs coming up. Labels, as I said, can apply both to a project and the resources within a project. And you might set a label based on what team the the particular project relates to, or what kind of resource is it? Is it a database? Is it a web server? Which division of your company does it relate to? Is it an alphabet project or a Huli project? That's the kind of labeling you can do at the project level or at the resource level. And not all services support resource level labels, uh, but the big ones do. There's a list of the 17 or so on our website that support that level of labeling. And we're always expanding labels to cover more surface area. Of course, this is a billing discussion. So the talk would not be complete without billing accounts. And a billing account is the entity in cloud that pays for projects and pays for the resources contained in them. One project is always funded by one billing account. And we'll talk about some of the trade-offs you can make and reasons why you might end up with multiple billing accounts. Uh, most probably have one. But it is valid for some larger organizations to have multiple accounts. Now, a note on billing account permissions. They are independent from project and resource permissions. So for example, if you gave your CFO the billing account administrator permission, even if that billing account funds all sorts of projects and resources, your CFO does not gain any project permissions as a side effect of being a billing account admin. So the billing account and billing permission space and the project and resource permission space are separate. And that's an intentional choice, because we think those roles are very different. And of course, it's easy to move projects between billing accounts. It's a one-click operation. You can switch them around if you ever have a need to consolidate or to split out those accounts. Of course, that's the structure. Now, how do you actually see the charges that are raised throughout this hierarchy of project folder org? Uh, we have a variety of tools that are offering visibility, being able to see and report on cost, accountability, who did what, when, control, making sure you can set budgets and alerts to know when you've crossed certain spending limits or dollar thresholds, and intelligence, trying to tell you what's happening next and forecasting your costs as your world shapes and moves in the cloud. This leads to a really, I, we think, really important first best practice, which is turn on your BigQuery billing export. And you might say, OK, that's a funny best practice. Why is that the first one? We'll see in a few minutes. The BigQuery billing export has the highest level of detail about what's happening from a billing perspective anywhere in GCP. It's a one-click operation to turn it on on your billing account on day one. And there's a free allocation of BigQuery storage and analysis. Even if you're a pretty large customer, it's really unlikely you'll ever pay more than a couple cents to run your BigQuery billing export. 
at two cents per gig of data. But it gives you tremendous visibility into what's happening under the hood. Hourly granularity of usage reporting, sliced by project, by label, uh, at every skew in our catalog. And we'll look at some examples of that coming up in a moment. So turn that on. We'll see how to in just a second. All right, enough of the hypothetical world. Let's get into the hello world. This might be a familiar picture for someone starting out on GCP. You have a billing account. It funds a project in blue. And you have a smattering of resources in that project, a little bit of compute engine. You've got a Kubernetes cluster. You've got some storage. You're running some BigQuery as a test to see if that's a nice data warehouse for you. And Cloud SQL maybe is the back end of your website. So here we have the fundamental relationship uh, of pays for versus owns, which is to say billing accounts pay for projects, and projects own resources. These are two separate kinds of relationships. As I said before, if your CFO is an admin of your billing account, they're funding the world, but they don't own any of those resources. They don't have any permissions on those resources as a side effect of having that billing role. So the pays for and owns world, the billing world and the resource world are split from a permissions and IM perspective. So let's take away some detail here and just get down and focus on the project itself. So you're a small company. You have these resources running. Things are good. You've hired some developers. You've hired Alice and Bob, one developer, one sysadmin. They're fantastic. You love them. You think they're the best. Unfortunately, Bob is not the world's best systems engineer, doesn't quite know what rm-rf does at the root, didn't know why that hung for so long after he pressed enter, scratching his head. Alice, fantastic, not the world's best SQL author, running along update clause, didn't actually scope it to anything, so that's running off into the woods. You start to think, hmm, maybe we should partition our world a little bit and split out production and development. Let's have two projects. Let's partition the world so that Alice and Bob can run whatever they like in development, not blow away everything in production. Of course, we've come to the first and fundamental reason why you might have projects in your world, and that is to enforce boundaries, to enforce permission boundaries, to enforce cost reporting boundaries, and maybe for namespacing purposes, if you want to tease out where your actual logical projects are really running. Now, once you've set up this world of a couple projects and a, a couple of resources, you'll, of course, get a monthly invoice. Uh, the invoice for us is a statement of what you owe Google. We don't think of it as a particularly good canonical cost report. And in fact, uh, later on this year and into next year, we'll be reducing the amount of detail that comes in your invoice. For any of you that work at a really large enterprise, who've been on GCP for a while, uh, as you may know, that invoice can get really, really long, like shockingly long. So we're taking that level of detail back out of the invoice and putting it into billing reports. We'll dive into each of those a little bit later. But invoices are to know what you owe Google. Billing reports are the best way to know what's happening, what the shape of your costs are by lots of different slices. And of course, the billing export is a great way to know down to the hour, down to the resource, down to the skew, what's happening. And this is the schema of a, of a billing export, but it gives you complete detail about what's going on under the hood. Setting up that export, as we said as our first best practice, involves going into your billing account, clicking on billing export, choosing a project and a data set name, and pressing go. And from that moment on, we'll write all that high resolution fine granularity billing data into BigQuery. So cost reporting is the why and the way to dig in and find out what's happening under the hood. We'll look at a couple more cost reports after we add a bit more structure to this organization. So we're growing. Our startup has gone from Alice and Bob toiling away with your pesky dog at their leg. And now we have a bunch of projects that break out the parts of our world. We have staging in a staging environment between dev and prod. We have a macro service, some old legacy application that we pulled in. It's where all the COBOL is. Any COBOL developers? Nope, I've offended no one, except those who haven't eaten lunch. 
Uh, the top secret project, the CTO put that there. We're not sure what that is. No one has permissions to it. It's probably fine. And our archive, big old storage buckets where we put some legacies and backups and other stuff. But of course, the yay, we have projects, can spiral into, oh dear, we have projects. There's too many of them. We lose hierarchy if we just have one org in this mass of projects in a flat structure. Now, you might note that I've cheated. I've presumed the next slide because, of course, uh, we've got this organization, but we might need some other layers to put under it. And we'll use folders for that in a moment. Um, but the same billing count funds all those projects. And we're actually adding a feature to make a default billing account at the org level. That's something we're testing today, and we'll start to roll out further over time. Uh, for those of you who have lots of projects and never want to think about which billing account funds them, this is something you'll want to turn on, and we expect to have most customers turn it on by default. So in this world of many projects, how do costs actually appear? Show me what the reporting looks like, James, wouldn't you? Here is our main view of cost reporting. And this is a graph by project over time of our spend with some trending. And the trending is a little bit clever. The dotted line uses some algorithmic magic to try and forecast based on a bunch of inputs what's going to happen in the future. It's not just a linear progression. It's doing more than that. And you notice on the right, there are a bunch of ways to filter and group this report. They are project by product family, by SKU, by label, and by region. And for those of you who've used this report before, you may note that region and label haven't always been there. Those are relatively new. The label is one that's key and really important for us. And we'll talk about that label versus folder trade-off in a minute. This is the first place to go. If you're looking at your invoice, if you're slicing and dicing yourself, Start here. Start by doing some filtering. And then if you need to go deeper, you can go into a big query view of the world or dig into the sort of secondary reports that sit around this. In BigQuery, you're one SQL query away from getting complete detail about what's happening in your world. This is a 13-line query that fans out this data, sums it by folder and by label. So this a little bit of SQL. But it's not much. And the level of detail and granularity you get is tremendous. Of course, you can use Data Studio and other visualization products trivially on top of BigQuery to see uh, a visualization of what's happening with those costs. We've recently added the cost table. And as we're taking detail out of the invoice to simplify that world, we're adding it to tabular reporting. So you can click a button and download a CSV as a convenient summary of your spending. We've also added the cost breakdown. Here we tell you why you're paying a certain amount of money with some common sense uh, waterfall, meaning how much of it were charges I paid due to usage, how much of it were my commitments in the form of committed use discounts, how much of it uh, did I get other discounts or sustained use discounts and credits applied against that usage? So you can see and break out the actual uh, savings you might be receiving. And finally, behind the invoice, there's also a CSV uh, that lists that similar tabular view of what's happening under the hood on a daily basis. Right, so we've gotten through organizations and projects. Orgs are for everyone. We encourage you to create an organization. You can attach it to a G Suite domain if you have G Suite, but you don't need G Suite. You can also turn on identity as a service and attach it to your own domain just for plain identity purposes, and that's free. So orgs are for everyone, regardless of whether you're a G Suite user or not. Right, let's get into folders and labels. As I said with my diagram before that kind of looks like it wants folders, of course, there's multiple ways to cut it. We could say, let's go by environment. What are our production projects, our staging projects, our development projects? We just acquired two companies. We'll put those in a biz dev world and maybe tease them out later as they come into the normalized world. 
Top secret, don't mention it. Just keep it off to the side. Doesn't need a folder. It's not there at all. Archive will leave by itself. But the key with folders is to align them to how you work. You can think about them as the primary key, the primary structure above projects. So it doesn't have to be this lens of the world. You could pick a different lens. Maybe you want to structure by what's my core application versus the old macro service, the legacy application, keeping BizDev alongside. Structure's up to you, but we think it's something worth thinking about and reasoning about carefully when you start this folder structure. Unlike labels, which are a little bit more ephemeral and can be easily changed, it's harder to change and shuffle folders and have consistent reporting over time. So give that some thought. And of course, you can have lots of folders. Now we've grown to the point where we have sales in multiple regions, and APAC, and EMEA, and we've nested them. So lots of depth if you care to go down that path. Use folders to mirror how you work. Think a little more carefully compared to some other structural choices about uh, what your folder schema should be. Now, when you've structured in this sort of style here by application, macro service, it's harder to answer uh, cross-cutting questions. For example, how much do we spend on databases? Can't do it by folder. Macro service has a database. Acquired code number two is all databases. We can't answer that question here. So let's zoom in just on the app world and think about how to do a sort of secondary index using labels. So we've broken out our folder, our projects. Let's look at the resources under the hood. We have Compute Engine, we have Storage, we have some PubSub. If you're running MySQL, for example, or Postgres on a bare metal GCE node, you might label them as an instance type of database. Now, Cloud SQL, of course, you can label as a database as well. But what if you have database backups sitting in storage? It's valid to label those two. So the label applies a cross-cutting view both in cost reporting and in BigQuery of the sort of secondary index view versus your folder structure. So folders are mutually exclusive. A project can only live in one folder. It can live in a, a hierarchy, but it must eventually live in one folder. Labels can be applied ad hoc, uh, lots of them as both key and values that you set, and you can apply them at the project level or at the resource level, as many as you like, change them over time. As we said, be deliberate, uh, especially in folder creation. We also pr suggest creating a dictionary for labels. And those are areas we're looking at adding features to as well to help uh, enforce that view of the world. Some services also automatically label your resources. And that's something to piggyback on. GKE, uh, Dataproc, Deployment Manager, append identifiers to clusters and to resources to help you do that without having to manually label yourselves. Now, how do costs appear in a label-centric world? In cost reporting, we have key and value. You can drop down on the side and do that slicing in this automatic view. And back in our BigQuery world, we have fanned out our labels up in our uh, query here. And you can, of course, filter, sort, group, however you like, by both label key and value. So labels are supercharging reporting. And uh, we think that's an area that's a, a fantastic way to kind of extend and expand uh, the cost reporting you're doing, especially as you start to fan out and have many more resources under the hood. So let's get into some more advanced topics and areas to think about as your organization grows. And for those of you in large organizations, some considerations beyond just folders and projects. First, billing roles and permissions. As I've said, and I'll say again, they're separate. First principles still apply on both sides of the billing permission hierarchy and the resource permission hierarchy. In particular, least privilege. So in the billing world, you can set up a billing account administrator who has full power to see, control, 
manage how that billing account is funded, what projects are associated with it. Uh, but you don't need to hand out billing account administrator privileges just to let someone report on costs. You can give them billing account viewer and reduce the risk of errors or accidental uh, misconfiguration or, or trouble in, in billing land. The same, of course, applies when you're looking at organization roles and permissions. And uh, a couple of really important ones to hit on. If you've started in a world where you don't have an organization and you've added it, bring across your billing accounts. It's a one-click operation to move them into your org. Of course, bring across your projects. But that provides the safety of the default roles and permissions set at the organization level. The second is, of course, move all projects in. The third is limit the number of people, the scope of the billing account creator role in your org. For most orgs, you have a billing account. You probably don't need another. And you don't want someone accidentally creating a second billing account, funding it with their credit card, even with good intentions, having them leave the company. And now poor Alice and Bob have real problems when their database disappears because the credit card is not working anymore. So restrict that permission and look to minimize the number of billing accounts in the scope of your org. Fewer billing accounts are generally better. But there are valid reasons to have multiple billing accounts. First, uh, costs in a project always land on a single billing account. You'll never have a billing account uh, that funds one part of a project and another part of a project going to a second billing account. Um, and each billing account always generates its own invoice in a single currency. So why might you have multiple? If you have multiple divisions in your company that operate in different currencies, or have a different accounting structure, roll up to different finance departments, or have a different purchasing process, you might want to have multiple billing accounts. They can coexist under one org and fund projects in any configuration you like inside that org. There's no firm relationship between which parts of the org are funded by which billing account. So you might have legal reasons. You might have currency reasons. They're totally valid. Um, and if you have interesting requirements there and are wondering if multiple billing accounts are right for you, uh, I'm happy to answer questions there, both in question time here or afterwards. Just come and find me. Uh, all things equal, fewer are better. Another key point here is that cloud billing support is free for all customers of cloud. Whether you pay for support or not, you always have billing support. And one of the interesting things you can do is you can grant cloud support temporary access to your BigQuery billing export if you'd like to let them see what you see. And, and they love it because it lets them really dive in and answer those detailed questions about why a particular charge was raised or why you're seeing something uh, that might not be self-evident. So there is a team there. And please uh, leverage them whenever you have questions you're struggling to answer. So to summarize, seven best practices. The first, turn on your BigQuery billing export on day one. It's likely to cost you nothing at all or pennies a month uh, as it's 2 cents per gig of storage. You'll be a very large customer by the time you're doing gigs a month of billing data. Use projects to enforce boundaries, both permission boundaries in the spirit of least privilege and cost and reporting boundaries when you know that a particular set of costs are always going to reside in one logical container. The third is use cost reporting rather than picking through lines in an invoice, because the aggregation and the slicing and dicing is more natural in that cost reporting view. The fourth, organizations are for everyone. Even if you're not a G Suite customer, you can use IDAS for free and get that extra level of control. Um, and as we said, we'll have a feature that lets you apply a default billing account across everything in the org. If you're a one billing account customer, you're never going to add another. That lets you have that billing account project relationship fade into the background and become something you don't ever have to think about or worry about again. The fifth is use folders to mirror how you work, but be 
invest in finding the right folder taxonomy early, as it's a little bit harder to change and shuffle projects among folders than it is to just change labels across resources. The sixth is when you need that secondary view of the world, cross-cutting, use labels, use as many as you like. Uh, they're incredibly flexible. And finally, if you do need help, cloud billing support is happy to help you, whether you're a paying support customer or not. There are, there's another session later today here in Harbor, which is Infra 202, I believe. Establishing Financial Governance on GCP. This session will dive into budgets, alerts, and other similar topics. How do you know when you've crossed boundaries in spending? How do you ensure that you're controlling the uh, environment that you've built and set up in this hierarchy? We also have two hands-on resources available, a hands-on training for understanding your GCP costs, and one for optimizing GCP costs. Uh, optimizing covers such topics as uh, cut analysis, which lets you see how much, uh, how much you should be using for, uh, should be committing to on committed use discounts in compute. And of course, there's a whole set of documentation and an overview of cost management on the Google Cloud website. With that, we will move on to questions. And please fill out the survey on your mobile app. Let us know what you liked, what you didn't like. And thank you for coming both to this talk and to next. We have microphones, so raise a hand if you have a question. And a microphone will find its way to you. Hi, good afternoon. So um, I was wondering, uh, because in the company I work for, we are a, a wood manufacturing uh, company. So we have uh, different factories mm -hmm. and different sections of the company that do different things. So uh, for us, the labels are not uh, kind of lack the entity we want for our factories. Mm. But we are all under the same domain. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping to be able to uh, just add different organizations with the same domain. So. So, because we, uh, uh, IT is centralized, so mm -hmm. we um, then push the costs to the other sections of, or to the other factories as, as IT costs. So we, uh, it would be really cool if we could get, for example, I don't know, a UK factory as an organization, and then, I don't know, a Spain factory and, and a staff, but all under the same billing account and all under the same domain. So it's that. Possible. Got it. Let me restate the question and answer it uh, a couple of different options. Okay. So the question is, with different departments in one company, can you have multiple organizations under the same domain? Um, the answer is not with the exact same domain. Um, and you may want to push down that level of structure down to folders. Um, a couple of other notes about that. A billing account can fund projects in any organization. So if you actually did have multiple orgs, which is not super common, you could fund them with a single billing account. The billing account doesn't mind. It will fund anything. Uh, but I, I would suggest you should consider folders and using either tabular reporting or the BigQuery export to group by folder. We are using folders now, but that quite gets really uh, long because you have all this structure behind the folder. For example, UK factory, and then you have production, development, and, and all the stuff you have there, but r in all repeated. the uh, repeated. So that's yep. kind of, you know, we, uh, uh, we think that folders lack the entity for us, for us, in our personal case, yep. to be, uh, you know, organization could be more for us. OK, well, l l come talk to me afterwards, because I'd love to introduce you to some of the folks who work on the organization side of the world to see what might suit your use case. OK, perfect. So thank you. Love to follow up. A couple more questions, several questions. In the middle. Yes, hi. Hi. Uh, I have a question on labels. If you have multiple labels on one specific thing, yes. how does the cost get split amongst the labels? It does not get split. It applies to all of them. But if you have if you have the same key for if you have 
two labels with the same key. Like you say you have a uh, compute instance that mm. both run a database and run a web server, for example. Got it. How does that cost end up in the report? In the report, um, you actually saw it. You saw the answer hidden in a SQL query. I'll go back to it, <laughs> see if I can click quickly. Um, BigQuery uh, supports nested structures in its supports nested values in its columns. So if you saw this ninth line, we unnested labels. Um, the way they appear, if you actually looked at the row without doing the unnesting, is you saw a row of cost for that skew for that hour, and then a set of key value pairs all applied to the same row. So you'd see one row with multiple key value labels all associated to it. So effectively, the cost, um, if, you, if you broke them out, you'd see the same cost for each label. We don't attempt to split. OK, so if you would uh, do a report, you would get, let's say, the machine cost $100 a month. Uh, it would be $100 for each key, unless you yes. do the math to split it. That's right. And I think we, uh, we're doing a lot of work in cost attribution. This is an area that's difficult for us, because we don't know the intent behind the label. Exactly. We don't know if it's duplicated or not, or how to tease it apart. Um, if you have a heuristic for us or a way that you think might work, we'd love to talk about it. Uh, because we, we really want labels to be used often for these kinds of cases. So thank you. Lots of questions on this side. Other side of the room, you're going to have to come. Oh, there are questions over there as well. I'm sure we'll get to them. Oh. You can go, first. go ahead. Everybody. Uh, firstly, thank you for the talk. Of course. Um, Secondly, um, I'm in the process of migrating uh, the applications we run over to GKE. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure in six months, I'm going to get asked, how much is this particular workload costing us on a month-by-month -month basis? It's very easy to see how much we're paying for the production GKE cluster, for example. But how much that workload costs? Is there any tools available to, to help attribute um, what that workload costs? Sorry. Yes. Uh, there are features coming in that domain. Uh, I would ask you to come talk to me about them, but that's an active area we're working on. Uh, the way we think about it is something like a sub-resource cost, right? You have a cluster or a workload, and you want to peer into it and say, what do the pieces cost? Uh, yes, area of active development. Come talk to me. I'll tell you where it is in its, in its life. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Yes. Uh, sorry, sorry for being naive. I uh, just wanted to ask a question about BigQuery. Yes. The export team, you said uh, to enable the billing exports to BigQuery. Yes. Uh, let's say I do that now. Do I still get historic data for all, all those months before? The query, uh, when you enable BigQuery today, it's from the point in time you enable it. It does not go retroactively. That's why we say it's a great practice to turn it on on day one. OK. Uh, that is something we're looking at. And let's say you make a change. Uh, let's say you change one of the labels that you used to use, or you just added new labels and everything. Will it be smart enough to uh, um, take on that change when you run your query, or do you have to adapt accordingly? You will see that change. There's some small delay in when that change uh, appears in BigQuery. Uh -huh. But you'll see that in, effectively in the next export forward, you'll see that label applied to the resource. And uh, the reason there's some small delay is that ser some services operate differently internally. Um, but in general, you'll see it on an hourly basis as soon as that label picks up in the next export. OK. So in practice, like, you have to like, think in advance like, how you'll be using those labels uh, before you actually apply, the, apply them, and then how you will combine it with the big query so you get the, the reports that you want, right? Yes, I would say if you're using labels in reporting extensively, uh -huh. you, you should have a, a governance policy, a, a, an approach that applies them. If you're using uh, tools that automate deployment of resources, yeah. you know the Terraforms, Ansibles, puppets of the world, you might bake in a strategy early on for a common schema of the core labels uh, and apply it as early as you can. OK, thank you. Here, thank you. Lost where the microphone went. Oh. 
Well, I find your presentation extremely useful for my case because I'm successful of, of the person who left the company, so I'm trying to understand the logic of existing billing accounts. So my question is, if it's possible to find this presentation somewhere publicly available, because I was searching and digging to cost management uh, uh, guidelines, but uh, this is the most useful thing I, I have ever seen, so it would be really useful to see it somewhere else also. Not, I cannot uh, take everything in the memory. Thank you. Um, the YouTube video will be public, and I it's believe good. we make the slides public as well. Um, but come talk to me afterwards. I can make sure you get a copy of the slides. Thank you. There's also a guide that is relatively new on the cloud billing website about um, billing account governance and organization kind of structural governance, uh, which is in the section that's listed at the end. So you, if it's probably new within the last couple of months. That's something worth looking at. But this is all public, so I'm happy to share it uh, uh, with you. Thank you. In the back. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I'm from a managed service provider, and we use a project per customer for containment purposes of the IP environment. and. Um, what, what we'd really like to have is um, this is obviously sustained use discount and there's committed use discount. And for us to, to leverage that committed use discount and the liability that that presents across the organization so we can have a look at a, a, a kind of a helicopter view of all those, all those resources in play and then take a, uh, an aggregated kind of uh, judgment really on maybe say 80% of what we're using. Uh, our customers are contracting for three or five year terms, so it certainly makes sense. Yep. Um, I've heard this is something that might come. Can you share any more uh, information on whether you see organizational co commitments coming in? I, I think the, uh, I, I would draw a distinction between organizational commitments versus billing account level commitments. Billing account level commitments are something we are exploring. And we're happy to talk to you about that. Come talk to us afterward. Um, those are in our future. Organizational level is uh, probably a little harder because an organization can cover multiple billing accounts sure. that are funded differently. Um, so at the billing account level, hopefully that also suits the yeah, same that would, purpose. That would, that would work for us. Yeah, well. we'd love to talk to you afterwards uh, about that. Thank you. We are moving in fr from a project to a billing account world. And this gentleman up in the middle has been waiting very patiently. So if we can. We'll get to all of you. We have seven minutes, so don't worry. So you've talked a lot about understanding the cost after the money's been spent. Yes. But I'd like to try to predict the costs beforehand. So yes. for instance, I have workflows that can be arranged in multiple ways, spinning up um, lots of small VMs for single tasks or one large VM for running multiple tasks in the same VM, that sort of thing. Is there or will there be an API which will allow me to put in a specification of an infrastructure and get back an estimated cost so I can start predicting and then measuring afterwards and understanding and improving on a cycle? This is an excellent question. Um, I, I can't commit to such an API at the moment. We have a cost calculator, which is, I would say, a human-entered facsimile of that. That's probably not what you need or want. <laughs> um, I'd love to talk to you about it. I, I, I think the use case is one we understand pretty well. What you put in and what you get out and how often you would call it are something we'd really like to talk to you about. So please talk to us. There's a couple of uh, product managers in our world here today, so we'll have a chance to catch up with you afterwards. Um, but we do appreciate the need. It's, um, we, we, the, the further ahead of uh, the current view of costs we can get for you, the better. And that's a critical way to do it. So thank you. Hello, yeah. Is Hi. It is it possible to enforce labels? We've got some labels we want to always be applied, so is it possible to set a policy to enforce labels? I know that there's some work in that area. I don't know the state of it at the moment. Uh, that product manager is also here. So uh, I can catch up with you after and, and go digging. Uh, it's an area that we've, we've definitely invested in, uh, but I'm not sure where it is at well, the moment. And, and secondly, then, w would it be possible to automate the application of a label uh, based on some reference, some logic, or, or something? Today, no. Uh, outside those few services that do it automatically. Um, but let's catch up. We'd, we'd love to talk about it. I think it, the more services where we can do automatic labeling that are helpful, the better. I think one of the challenges we find in automatic label application is um, we want them to be useful. 
and we have find there's varying definition of what's useful to our customers. So we don't want to wind up in a state where you look at a resource and it has 50 auto-generated labels that you have to pick through that don't actually suit you. So let's, let's talk about it. I'm building myself a good queue to keep my, me from going to lunch. More questions? Uh, one way over there or in the middle? Yes, hi. Um, I was wondering at the, the graph that you showed of the report, yes. what, le what level is that available at? Organization, folder, projects, et cetera? The graph, uh, this, I think it's this one. There was another form of it before that was stacked, but it's the same graph. Um, this graph is showing you billing account level data. So it's showing you all of the projects under the billing account. Okay. And this goes back to this flexibility that an organization can span multiple billing accounts, can span multiple folders, right? So it, you could, in theory, have multiple of these views under an organization. We don't yet have this at the organization level. OK. Is there any way to kind of show a filter of the view at a certain level, so like a subsection of projects? If you only have one billing account, you might not want certain projects to be able to see other projects' costs. Ah, got it. Excellent question. Um, in the cost report, we don't have that level of permissions. One interesting trick now for, the, for those of you who've remained, you get a really good advanced, advanced version. Uh, in BigQuery, it is super straightforward to make views on BigQuery data. It's really, it's, you know, it's two-liner. And you can make a view that only grants access to certain projects. And so we find, actually, in the Emmet, we had a managed service provider question. We find that often, uh, big BigQuery users will delegate out views of their data across projects, across folders for that kind of use case. And then you can apply Data Studio on top of it for visualization. So it's not trivial, but it's quite doable in BigQuery. Thank you. You're welcome. Question over there. Uh, first of all, it's always great to see another VA Linux alumni. <laughs> how are you doing, James? Hi, Mark. How are you? <laughs> um, so this is a little bit duplicative with an earlier question, but so we have we have a contractual discount, which I think applies to our billing account, and then there's going to be CUD or SUD discounts that apply. Yes. If I understand what you said, that should be more transparent in the billing report now, which is great, but it would also be really helpful to have that in a forecasting tool. Yeah. This is, a, this is a great question. Um, I think it's similar to the sort of looking forward API question. Can you go and say, this is my, the shape of my resources. What's it going to cost me? Um, we don't have it yet. That's another area we're very interested in. So I'll queue you up as another, one, another person to talk to for a couple of reasons, both historical and present. So um, the forecasting part for us is it's one thing to forecast based on what we've seen in the past. The more difficult thing is to understand the shape and change of your business over time. And so to give two counter examples, we have retailers who have a Black Friday, Cyber Monday spike. And if you looked at them from January until November 21st, you would forecast one thing. If they provided the input that said, here's what's about to come, you know, you'd have a skyscraper of usage going up at the end of November. It's tough for us to understand that input, but we are very interested in figuring it out. So thank you. More questions? We have one minute and 30 seconds. So we have one, two, three. We'll do them quick. 30 seconds each. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, I just have a quick question about the data access logs. Yes. Uh, I enabled them for uh, storage. Uh, and I was wondering, I, I was trying to figure out uh, how much of the cost was due to the data access logs as opposed to the audit logs as well. Um, and I believe they come under the same row in BigQuery. So it, it labels a way to quantify that. Yes. I don't know offhand how they're stored in GCS. Is it a separate GCS bucket? Or I assume it's in GCS. In, is it in a storage bucket? Uh, yeah. Yes. I believe you could label the bucket and see that independently. OK, so you can label the bucket specifically. Yes. And then that would appear on a new row under Stackdriver login. Correct. Uh, not under Stackdriver. It would be, um, we'll, I'll have to check on how that actually, what line item that's in today. But let's look at it. I think, it, I think labeling is the correct way to do it if, if it's at the GCS level. 
If it's in Stackdriver itself, I'm not sure you can tease that out. Okay. Um, but I'm happy to check in with you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. You got to, thanks. Two more. Oop, 10 seconds each now. Sorry, uh, how granular can you get the labels? So what I mean, like, uh, I know you can set it for, like, uh, your compute distances or whatever, but, like, can I set it on a BigQuery job basis? So I know this job comes from this whatever task, which is which user. And question number two, um, can you export also to PubSub and not only BigQuery? Uh, only to BigQuery today, though off the back of BigQuery, you can do many other things. Okay. Um, so there's a REST API into BigQuery that might allow you to do that, uh, but not by default today. And on um, granularity, it depends on the service. And so I don't, I'm not sure offhand uh, what the granularity is in BigQuery, uh, but we can look at it if, if you like, or it's a question for the BigQuery team. Okay, um, some services you. have high granularity, some services are more, more broad. So we've run out the clock. Now I'll happily answer the follow-up questions. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you all for coming to Next. Uh, appreciate it. Have a great day.